Well, hello. Welcome back to Walden Community Church. Hey, I was, uh, I was thinking this week that maybe one of the reasons that people might uh, stay away from Christianity or even avoid all religion in their life is because there, there appears to be a lot of rules, right? Rules that you have to follow. And when we hear that word, or when we think about rules, we typically think about the word no, right? When we say the rule is you can only drive 65 miles an hour, right? What we hear is no, you can't drive 66 miles an hour, or no, you can't drive 86 miles an hour. <laughs> and most people know the Bible has a lot of rules. We could name some of them, no stealing, no murdering. But what I would like to talk about is God is not the God of no. He is not the God of no. I think he is the God of yes, because our God is a heavenly father, right? And so he is helping all of us grow. And so while it might seem like there are a lot of no's in life, it's really so we can learn, that we can grow mature, that we can grow wise. God says yes to plenty of things. Uh, yes, he does say no, <laughs> but I think those no's are to lead us to his yeses. I believe he is the God of yes. So today, I wanna to talk about saying yes to wise living. Saying yes to wise living, because I think that's relatable. I think that's something that we could all get on board with and say, yeah, I would, I would like more wisdom, right? But where do you go for wisdom today? Where does the average person go for wisdom? The internet, right? That thing that we used to be so skeptical about, so cautious of, now we take its word as law. I remember as a kid, we were taught how to write an essay. And our teacher taught us that when you write an essay, you have to include a bibliography and you have to include footnotes. Otherwise, what you're writing is useless. So whenever I stated a fact and I didn't quote where I got that fact from, my teacher would circle it and write the word source with a question mark. She was asking, what's the source for your statement? You can't say, everybody loves hot dogs. Because <laughs> it sounds like it might be true, but it's not. And if it is true, then cite your source. Today, we can just type anything and we don't have to have any sources. We don't have to say where we get our facts from. And when we read it, we take it as wisdom. Our favorite place to get wisdom uh, is YouTube, probably on the internet right? Because if you can't fix your kitchen sink, go to YouTube. It'll help you. Uh, if you can't change a light bulb, go to YouTube. It'll help you. Want to learn how to change a spark plug, change a air filter? You can look it up on YouTube. My prediction is in the future, going forward, the, the how-to section at the bookstore is going to shrink because more and more people, experts, they're going to realize that it's easier to just make a YouTube video than it is to write a book. But it's really too bad that we don't also find the Bible in the how-to section. We find it in the religion section. And I don't know why. I don't, I don't know why. Because if you look up the word religion, the word religion says, the belief in and worship of a superhuman controlling power, especially a personal God of gods, or a particular system of faith and worship, or a pursuit or interest in which someone ascribes supreme importance. So religion, as defined, is either a belief, a system, or a pursuit, right? And I hope you then would agree that if that is the definition of religion, then the Bible doesn't belong in the religious section. It belongs in the how-to section. Because as a Christian, for me, it's about a relationship. Christianity is a way of living. 
It is not a way of believing. It's more about growing in wisdom than it is adhering to one particular system. It's about becoming more like Christ. So it's never about what I believe or what I think is important. Yes, the Bible tells you how to live. It's also how to live with wisdom, how to live wise. Saying yes to wise living is how God wants us to live. True, the Bible has rules. It does. It says thou shalt not a bunch of times. But they're not there to cripple you. They're not there to hold you back. They are there to grow you and make you wise. Think about it. If God is real, then to have biblical wisdom would mean to be that you are in harmony with what is real, in harmony with reality. If God is real, why would I want to live apart from him? Why would I want to live separate from him? My family, my entire family, uh, spends a lot of time on YouTube. We do, and we're terrible. <laughs> we, we could argue that much of what we watch is to make us wise, to learn, to grow. And, and maybe you read books. Maybe you listen to podcasts. Maybe you take college classes for fun. Whatever it is, we do this to improve ourselves and to improve our life. But the reality is, that's just more of me saying yes to the world. Because if you're not obtaining biblical wisdom, then I'm not living in God's yes. To truly say yes to wise living is to pursue the life that God wants me to live. Why? Why should you pursue the way God wants you to live? Well, first, because then your life will be blessed. Your life will be aligned with his principles. And then second, over the long haul, you'll be more successful. You'll be able to face all of life's difficulties. And third, more of God's wisdom and more of his yes in your life will bring you more peace. Less self-inflicted wounds, less regret, and more of your life in harmony with his. So we're going to look at the Sermon on the Mount today. This is Jesus' largest teaching, and it's a good place for us to discern how God wants us to live. So because I think most of us follow our own wisdom, right, or we follow conventional wisdom, and we think that that's the right choice, I mean, why listen to God, right? Religion is outdated. The Bible is outdated. So it seems like, it seems like the right choice is to follow what everybody else is doing. But Jesus spends his time in the Sermon on the Mount turning conventional wisdom on its head. Throughout the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says, you have heard it said, you have heard it said, you have heard it said, over and over, you have heard it said. You have heard it said is the word on the street, right? It, it's, the, it's the, you have heard what everybody else is saying. Jesus says, you've heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemies. And then he says, but I say, love your enemies. Proving that worldly wisdom and godly wisdom are not the same. You can't get to heaven and say, well, I lived a good life. According to who? The world? Worldly wisdom and godly wisdom are not the same. Conventional wisdom says, don't talk about religion. It's, you know, it's, it's none of our business. Jesus says, but I say, no one lights a lamp and covers it. Proving that worldly wisdom and conventional wisdom are not the same. Worldly wisdom says, you know what? It's just a little office flirtation. Doesn't, it's not any big deal. Jesus says, but I say, anyone who looks with lust has already cheated. Conventional wisdom says, it's, it's, just, a little, it's just a little lie. It's a little white lie. It doesn't hurt anyone. And Jesus says, but I say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Worldly wisdom and godly wisdom are not the same. And Jesus teaches the Sermon on the Mount. He gives all these, all these proclamations, all these teachings, and then to finish, to wrap it all up, he says in verse 24, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Don't we want to be wise? Of course we do. 
is this going to work for everyone or just some people? I mean, listening to Jesus, his teaching, is it, it's, for, it's for some people, right? It's just, it, it only works for Christians. It doesn't work for anybody else. Jesus says it works for everyone. He says everyone, everyone. So there's a difference between intelligence and wisdom. I know. You, you might not have heard that before, but there is. Because some people, I think, are good with computers. They're good with art, good with tools, good with music, good with cooking. Because when the information goes in their brain, it sticks. It sticks, and to them, everything just falls in place and makes sense. But wisdom is not intelligence. Wisdom is putting that knowledge into practice successfully correctly. In other words, wisdom is how you live. It's how you live. Jesus says wisdom is building a firm foundation on him, not knowing about him, right? And not even knowing about building. It's the actual act of building. Not knowing about building, building, the verb. A few years ago in Bowling Green, Wisconsin, they had a 40-foot sinkhole open up under the National Corvette Museum, and it claimed the lives of eight classic Corvettes. <laughs> Why is worldly wisdom not enough? Because you need to open your life up to having more stability in your life, more trust, because when these life events, when these sinkholes, when they open up underneath you and they swallow you, what are you going to have as your support, as your foundation? They say the average person experiences five major catastrophes in their life. What is going to be the bedrock for you to get you through those? Believe me, there's no YouTube video that's going to answer those questions. Let's read the entire passage. Jesus says, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house on the rock and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat at that house, but it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat against that house and it fell and great was the fall of of it. Now, the obvious question after reading that is, why would anyone build their house on sand? Right? Doesn't make sense. Why do that? Well, there are only three reasons to do anything. Because it's good, because it's fast, and because it's cheap. Why build your house on the sand? It's fast and it's cheap. If you build your house on sand, you can start right now. You don't have to spend any time doing any initial legwork. You don't have to dig down to find bedrock. You don't have to lay a concrete slab. It's easier and cheaper to do it this way. But do you think people do that with their own lives? Of course they do. People are always looking for an easy, or lazy way to live. What else can you build your life on if it's not God? There are other things you can build your life on? Sure, there's lots of, there's lots of sand out there, right? Career, career is a big one. Philosophy, science, politics, jobs, family. And there's even religious things. There's religious things that you could build your life on that don't have anything to do with God. You could build your life on tradition or ritual, or a creed, or a confession, or good works, or even a false religion. But also notice that it's not the building material that Jesus has problems with, it's just the foundation. In other words, you can't build on baptism. Baptism's great, it's good, it's a building material. Church membership is good. Living a moral life, that's good. But they are not foundational. They're not foundational. Jesus Christ is the only foundational material. 
And Jesus tells us that building your life on anything else is a poor choice. Not just a poor choice, he says. He says it's foolish, right? He says it's foolish. An atheist would say, well, I'm not going to build my life on Jesus. Jesus isn't real. God isn't real. Psalm 14 says, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The world says, you don't have to believe in Christianity or this or that. You can believe anything you want. You, you can believe in yourself. Just, just believe in yourself. Proverbs 28 says, he who trusts in himself is a fool. And that's just the Old Testament. That's the Old Testament. That's the wisdom that has been around for the ages. But then Jesus comes along. He brings his teaching from the Sermon on the Mount, and he adds himself to the scriptures. He makes himself equal to the scriptures. And he says that a foolish person hears his words and then doesn't do his words. So we need to build on a firm foundation. We need to build on a firm foundation. One time there was a well-known author. He was asked to speak at Ohio State, and the taxi driver drove him past the Wexner Art Center. And the driver, driver commented that that building is so unique, so unique because the architect who designed that building designed it around a postmodern view of reality, a postmodern view of truth. And the author said, how? What, what's a postmodern view of architecture? What does, that, what does that even mean? And the taxi driver said, well, the building has no pattern. There's some staircases that go nowhere. The pillars, the columns, they don't support anything. And it's just a, a, a monument to uh, symbolize how postmodernity goes nowhere, that it's mindless, that it's senseless. And the author said, did they, did they build the entire building that way? Did they build, that, did, did they build the foundation that way? And the taxi driver said, of course not. You can't do that with a foundation. Jesus says that the person who builds on a firm foundation is wise. Proverbs 4 says, wisdom is supreme, therefore get wisdom. Though it cost you all you have, get understanding. Proverbs 9 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning, and knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. So how does Jesus define who is a wise builder? He describes the wise builder as a person who hears the word of God and who is faithful in doing the word of God. Because that's the important part. We can, we can be attentive easily. There's lots of great ways that you and I can be attentive to the word of God. You can read it. I encourage you to read it. Read it. Read it every day. There's reading plans that'll help you read your Bible through in a year. There's even uh, Bibles you can buy, like the Daily Bible. It'll break all the Bible reading down for you so that you can get through it in a year. And I think after reading it, you also should be a part of something that allows you to study it, right? It's not just enough to read it. We should study it. You should analyze those words and figure out how they speak to you, how they, how they teach you, how they apply to your life. And then you need to reflect on what you learn, right? Take some time and, and let those words sink in. Meditate on them. Chew on them. We have a Sunday school every Sunday morning. We have an adult Sunday school class at 11. You're more than welcome to attend. We have a Wednesday afternoon class at 4. It's open to everyone. You can, you can come. Next year, we're probably going to add another one at 6. You, you could organize a small group in your own house. You just invite five or seven other people over to your house. If you want to do it that way, we'll even help you get started. I'll help you get started. You can host a small group in your house. That's a great way to serve and grow the church. But it's also a great way to meet new people. It's a great way to show hospitality. But aside from just Jesus, the other parts of the Bible agree too. James says, faith without works is dead. He says, do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourself. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself, goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it 
not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, they will be blessed in everything they do. You know, Eugene Peterson, the guy who helped translate and edit the Bible to uh, the message, right? He was, the, he was the chief editor and the translator for the message. He tells a story that illustrates the dependency between reading and doing. He says when he was 35, he bought a pair of running shoes and he started running and he just loved long distance running, loved that smoothness, loved the rhythm of it. And he started competing in 10K races like once a month. And then he would do a marathon once a year. And he started getting all of these uh, running magazines, you know, subscriptions that would come to his house to talk about running and he would read those. And then one time he said he pulled a muscle and then he couldn't run for a couple of months. And the magazines would still come to his house, but he stopped reading them. But the moment he started running again after he healed, then he started reading the magazines again. And that's when he realized that the reading was an extension of something that he was doing, something that he was a part of. He was reading for companionship, he was reading for affirmation, because he was taking in all the experiences from other people about their running. And he learned a few things, he said, but mostly it was about how he could deepen his world of running. He said, if I wasn't running, then it didn't matter if I read the magazines. Only running, only doing helped him draw closer and deepen that relationship. The parallel, he says then, with reading the Bible is very similar. He said, if I'm not living in an active response to the living God, if I'm not just reading about his creation and salvation and holiness, that's not enough. It's not gonna hold my interest for long, he said. The most important question isn't, what does this mean? He said, the most important question is, what of this can I obey? What of this can I do right now? Just simple obedience. Obedience opens up our lives to the text. It, so much quicker than any Bible study. So much quicker than any dictionary. So, many, so much quicker than anything you can read. Well, hopefully, your life won't have any sinkholes, right? That's what the verse said. No, it said when, right? It said, and the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat on that house. It didn't say if. So the sinkholes happen to all of us, right? In, in Jesus' story, it happens to the wise, and it happens to the foolish. But what's the difference between the two? Was it just that the foolish person didn't hear Jesus? No. The foolish person heard Jesus. Jesus says the wise person heard and obeyed him. And that's crucial for us when we face the storms of life. Everyone you know, your neighbors, your friends, your family, your, mem uh, your, your the people that you live with, even people in this, even people in your church, right? Everyone. They have either built their house on the rock or they have built their house on sand. Everyone, everyone. And if you walk back up to any house that was in Jesus' day and you just kind of casually looked at the house, you couldn't tell. You couldn't tell if the house was on rock or sand. They would look the same. They would look the same until the ground opens up. Storms reveal foundations. How does Jesus describe the storm? He said it hit from all sides right? There was pressure from above, the rains descended. There was pressure from below, the floods came. There was pressure from all around, the winds blew. You see, this is why we say that becoming a Christian doesn't save you from hardships or tragedy. It doesn't even save you from ever sinning again. Christians experience hardship. In the book of Job, the accuser tells God that God's favored one, Job, he hasn't experienced any hardship. He says he hasn't experienced any hardship. You've kept him in, in this 
hedge of protection, he says. In other words, Job has a fence line around his property that's made up of thorny shrubbery that keeps wild animals out. But will a hedge protect you against rain? No. Will it protect you against a flood? No. Would it protect you against wind? No. So Jesus isn't teaching a parable about how to build your house in a protected environment. It's a parable about the foundation that your life sits on, not about avoiding the sinkhole, not about avoiding weather. The outcome is determined by the foundation you are sitting on. There are no storm-free zones. There are no storm-free lives. Your faith and your happiness will be tested. We will go through these trials of life, and these trials of life are not going to be disguised. It's not going to come to you as a, as, a, as a rainbow, right? It's not going to look like sunshine. I think the Bible story we most often think of in this is Peter, right? Peter walked on water, but he didn't just walk on water. He walked on water during a storm. The Bible says immediately he made the disciples get into a boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there alone. But the boat, by this time, was a long way from land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. Peter said yes. Right? Peter said yes in that moment, didn't he? Conventional wisdom said, stay in the boat. The boat is safe. But biblical wisdom says, the only true safe place is with Jesus. What was Peter's foundation? Was he walking on bedrock? No. <laughs> he was walking on water. But in truth, he was walking on the words of Jesus. He was walking on trust. He was walking on faith. Peter knew that that's Jesus. That's Jesus in front of me, right? So he didn't ever doubt that that was Jesus. In fact, he shows great trust and great faith in that moment. And I don't know if I would have stepped out of the boat in that moment. I don't know. But as long as Peter focused on the Lord, he walked on water. As soon as he turned his attention to the storm, to the sinkhole, right? To the, to the pitfalls of life, he sank like a rock. Or I guess we could say that he sank like a Peter, right? <laughs> And the same thing will happen to us, right? The same thing will happen to us. We step out in faith, we're doing God's will, answering God's call for our lives, and then the moment a storm strikes, our children rebel against us, we lose our job, we go through a divorce, we experience a death, no matter what, right? Something big, feels like you're struggling, trying to climb out of a pit, can't get ahead. You become disorientated, and you turn away from God because conventional wisdom says, you should do this. Conventional wisdom says, you should do this. And then we do it and we sink. We sink. But the reason that Jesus calls out to Peter and the reason that Peter says yes wasn't that the boat wasn't a safe place to be. It, it, it was. Peter, I mean, the other disciples aren't wrong. The, the boat is a safe place to be. But the reason J Jesus asks us to say yes in those moments is not to pull us out of the boat. It's to pull us closer to him. It's safer to be with him. So it's very important that we remember to stay focused on the Lord.
and to trust that God will see us through those pitfalls, those sinkholes, despite what's happening around us. I'm originally from California. I am, I'm from California. Uh, October 17th, 1989, there was a massive earthquake in San Francisco. I was working at Toys R Us that day, that time. Uh, the earthquake happened 90 miles away. And when uh, we looked up at uh, Toys R Us, our light fixtures were swinging 90 miles away from the earthquake. The South Pier of the Golden Gate Bridge sits directly on top of the San Andreas Fault, yet it's one of the safest structures in that area. And it was undamaged in that quake because the foundation of that bridge rests on towers at either end. They are embedded in rock underneath the bay. Now, many of you might remember the news footage from that time, and you might remember seeing the double-decker freeway in Oakland, okay? Directly across the bay from San Francisco. That collapsed because it was built on land that had been filled in. Both bridges looked the same until the storm. It all looked the same until it was tested. So if it's safer saying yes to Jesus, and if it's safer to follow biblical wisdom, then why don't more people become Christians? Why don't more people believe in God? Well, because the rest of the world trusts their gut. I guess they're just flying by feeling, by emotion. They listen to their internal voice. They trust their hunch and, and common sense. But biblical wisdom says your feelings, your emotions, they can mislead you. It's better to build your foundation on truth. God's word is reliable. It's trustworthy. It's consistent. Peter starts to go under the water. And he says, Lord, save me. And Jesus reaches down without hesitation and takes Peter's hand. Think about that. Because conventional wisdom says stay in the boat. But Peter knew that even in a storm, it's safer to be with Jesus. Because he's right there to help us. Right there. Saying yes to biblical wisdom is saying yes to how God wants you to live. In another part of the book of James, James says, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Notice, if I say yes, God says yes right back. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for these Bible passages, and we pray that they don't just go in one ear and out the other. They're not just words on pages, but they are words to be obeyed, words to be lived, words to be processed in our brains and then acted out by our bodies. Lord, your son said that we should hear his words and obey them. Before he left this earth, he said we should baptize and teach the world to obey. Lord, so many of what we struggle with right now in the world is lack of obedience. We are all obeying worldly wisdom and not biblical wisdom. We're saying yes to the world and no to you. And as your children, it should be the other way around. So much of what we struggle with, fight over, argue with, so much of the division that we see in this world would be eradicated if more of us would say yes to biblical wisdom, to say yes to you as our foundation. Help each one here to build a firm foundation. Amen. Well, it's the 30th. For me, right now, it's the 30th, and that means tomorrow is Halloween. Tomorrow is Halloween, and so in our neighborhood in Walden, we will have a trunk or treat event here at the church. Uh, it's gonna be at 5 p.m. It'll run for two hours till seven. So please come at five, don't show up early. I know it seems like conventional wisdom says show up early. We won't be ready for you. We won't be ready. Uh, we're not gonna, we won't start until five. 
So be there at five uh, and then you'll have plenty of time to get out to your neighborhood and go trick or treating. We're gonna have a live DJ, we're gonna have a bounce house, we're gonna have the Chick-fil-A truck. There's gonna be a lot going on and it's free to the community because we wanna be the church where you live. I love you guys, I'll see you soon, bye.